Hi, thanks for joining us for our midweek Bible study here at Family of God Community Church. Hi, thanks for joining us tonight as we begin a brand new series. We're going to be looking over the next eight weeks at the characteristics of a successful believer that are found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. As we go through this, I hope that you'll be strengthened in your faith and that you will learn to grow and become a successful believer in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful care and your love. We thank you for watching over us and for providing for our every need. We thank you that you love us and that you want us to be successful. And so, Lord, as we look into your word, we pray that you would continually teach us and guide us through the direction of your Holy Spirit. And may your words ring true in our hearts and lives, that we might truly be everything that you have created us to be. For these are the things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's begin uh, by looking at tonight's message in beginning a life of faith. We all have this opportunity in life to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He made his gospel known throughout the world, and we heard it and we believed. But in order to have a successful life of faith, it begins by having a faith in Jesus Christ. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at this passage in 2 Peter chapter 1, where it says simply, giving all diligence, add to your faith. In other words, you have to have faith first. So we, we understand that faith is the foundation for everything that we look at. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, give all diligence and add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and then finally, to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, these are the elements that make us successful as believers in Jesus Christ. So in order for us to begin this life of faith, let's first understand what the obstacles to faith are. There are certain obstacles that stand in the way of us actually having faith. The scripture tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, do not love or cherish the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and then here we see these three things, the lust of the flesh. Now that's a craving for sensual gratification. Then secondly, the lust of the eyes. That's greedy longings that are found in the mind. And then finally, the pride of life. That's an assurance of one's own resources or in the stability of earthly things. In other words, you're just pride-filled with the things that you possess or that you think you have control over in your life. It says these things, these three things, 
They do not come from the Father, but are from the world itself. And the world passes away and disappears, and with it the forbidden cravings, the passionate desires, the lust of it. But he who does the will of God and carries out his purposes in his life abides or remains forever. And so we're going to take a look at these elements over the next eight weeks. But let's first understand these obstacles, these three things. They are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Let's break them down into a simpler format. Number one, the lust of the flesh is sensual gratification. Sensual gratification. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, and we're going to look at this verse a couple of times, it says, Mortify therefore your sensual appetites. In other words, we all have these sensual appetites in our life. And I'm going to look at this verse a little more closely later. But we need to understand that these sensual appetites are something we need to put away. The word mortify means to put to death. In other words, we don't need these sensual appetites, fornication, impurity, irregular passions, wicked desires, licentiousness. I'll have to explain that to you later. But we look at this and we understand that sensual appetites, sensual gratification is one of those things that robs us of our faith. They're not of God. What is, in fact, the danger of sensuality? Well, the scripture tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 to 8, now, sensual inclinations, these are these sensual gratifications, these appetites, the danger in them is that they lead to death. But spiritual affections to a life of tranquility or peace. Because a sensual disposition of mind is averse to God. It's, a, it's opposed to God. It's not following the things of God. For it is not subject to the divine law, nor indeed can it be. So that they who are in a carnal state, who have their life controlled by the lust of their flesh, they cannot be acceptable to the divine being. They cannot be acceptable to God because their whole life is tied up in the lust of their flesh, their addictions to this and that, their consequences that directly relate to those sensual appetites, those sensual gratifications, and the danger of them is that they lead to death. The second thing that we saw in that passage of Scripture in 1 John was not just the lust of the flesh, which are the, the cravings for sensual gratification. If it makes me feel good, therefore it is good. That's not necessarily true. Some things that can make you feel good actually lead you down a path that leads to death. And so we look at that danger that's there. So we have sensual gratification, the lust of the flesh. Then we move on to the lust of the eyes, the things that we have greed for. I, I, I desire that. We, we have a word for that in the scripture. It's called covetousness, but it's actually just a big word for greed. You become greedy. You long for all these things that you see and you want them. And so they become a part of that. We call this selfish desires. In other words, they're totally focused on what I want. Sensual gratification, if it makes me feel good, then it's good for me. That's not true. The second element, selfish desires. I want it, therefore I should have it. Those selfish desires have a certain danger too. The scripture says in Romans chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, Shall we say then that the law itself is sinful? See, some people are actually saying, well, the law is sinful. No, it's not. Of course not. But it was the law that made me know what sin is. And if the law had not said, do not desire what belongs to someone else, I would not have known such a desire. But by means of that commandment, sin found its chance to stir up all kinds of, and here's the concept, selfish desires or greed in me. And apart from the law, sin is a dead thing. So you and I know it's wrong to covet. We know it's wrong to want something that belongs to someone else to the point where we will greedily go after it, even to the point of deceiving someone or stealing it. And that is what happens a lot of times in people's lives. Let's talk about the nature of covetousness. The nature of covetousness. 
Because you see, when you go down that path, that greedy path of giving in to your selfish desires, it leads to a lot of other things. Here's that verse of scripture that we looked at earlier. It says, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do, first of all, with sexual immorality. Don't go down that path. Don't have anything to do with impurity. Don't have anything to do with lust and evil desires. And then finally, it adds this statement. It says, don't be greedy. Some people just, their lives are consumed by greed. They have to have everything. They not only have the lust of the flesh, they want something that makes them feel good, but now they've fallen into the trap of being greedy. Their selfish desires lead them in directions and paths where they will uh, lie, rob, steal. They will do all kinds of things in order to get what they don't have. You know, in, in James, he said, you, you, you lie and deceive and you even kill in order to get what you do not have. And so we look at this and greed is a terrible thing. Why? For a greedy person is an idolater. They worship the things of the world. A lot of people think that the appetites, sexual appetites, are just a lustful form, but they can be more than that. Sometimes people have a greed. They are idolaters. They worship being like that. They worship having that uh, in their life. And so they become idolaters, and they begin to worship the things of the world. And so we have... First of all, the lust of the flesh, that's sensual gratification. Then we have the lust of the eyes, that's selfish desires. And then finally, we have the security deceptions. In other words, we place our security not in Jesus Christ, not in Him, not in God providing for all of our needs, but we fall prey to security deceptions. And there are three of these that I want to mention to you tonight. Number one is wealth. Wealth can be a security deception. I have met people in the church all my life. I've been in the ministry over 40 years. And in my lifetime, I have noted that sometimes people who have great earthly wealth, in other words, they live in a big house, they drive a fancy car, they have a tremendous income, uh, they have a tendency to think that because they're wealthy and they give to the church that they have it made, that they're going to get to heaven. But I got news for you. Jesus said it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. Why did he say that? You can't take it with you. You see, the eye of a needle was a small uh, gate that was on the eastern side of the city in the wall of Jerusalem. And so you could not take a camel through there if it was laden. Oh, it could kneel down and go through it if it didn't have any, anything on it. But if it was laden, if it had all this baggage with it, there's no way it could ever go through the eye of a needle. And so he said this, you can't get there with all these possessions. Wealth does not give you a guaranteed acceptance into heaven. It is a false sense of security. It is a deception by nature. Here the scripture says in Luke chapter 12, and Jesus said, watch out and guard yourselves from every kind of greed because your true life is not made up of the things you own no matter how rich you may be. Just because you're wealthy does not mean that you possess spiritual understanding. It does not mean that you're going to heaven. You say, but I give a lot to the church. Well, good for you. But you don't realize that you're giving to the church and the Lord is blessing you financially for it, but you cannot take it with you. You need to understand that security is not found in wealth. There have been many, many people who have been wealthy I've seen in the church over the years. And what happens is that wealth is a deception to them. And they actually think that because they're wealthy, they can hold the highest positions in the church they can uh, demand their own agenda in their own way because they did not realize they had fallen prey to the other things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and now the pride of life. So wealth is a security deception. You can't take it with you. It's not going to benefit you spiritually. Here's the second thing, power, security deceptions. There are a lot of people that love their titles and love their positions that they hold 
in our in the life of the church or in the life itself they love being in control one of the reasons i believe that we uh, have never been able to get term limits for politicians with the exception of the office of the presidency is because there's too much power associated with those positions and they will never relinquish that power it's going to be a difficult thing to ever see term limits in congress why because power and that is too is a deception there are a lot of people that think they're in control but i have learned that control is an illusion there are always things that are outside the boundaries of our control in habakkuk chapter 2 there's an observation that god gives to habakkuk about a gentleman that was in their midst and he said this look at that man he's bloated by self-importance he's full of himself but he's so empty. In other words, he's got all of his titles and he's got his authorities and he's got his passions, but his soul is absolutely empty. It is not something that's going to fulfill him. And when he lays on his deathbed, who's he going to look to? What power is it that's going to keep him from dying? There is none. And so as you look at this, we understand that security is never found in wealth. You can have all the money in the world, but you're still going to die. And you're still going to face an eternity that you have to decide. Is it going to be in Christ or not in Christ? You might have the greatest excuse me, authority and all the power in the world. But if you do not have Jesus, your soul empty. You don't have anything. Uh, Jesus said, how horrible it is to gain the whole world and lose your own soul. And that was the same application here in Habakkuk. Another passage in James chapter 4, James says, As it is, you are full of your grandiose selves, and all such vaunting self-importance is what? It's evil. It does you no good. It is a security deception. And then we look at this, not just wealth, not just power, but here's the biggest one, intellect. People love to think they are smart. And they will even tell you that an intelligent person does not believe in God. Someone who possesses a level of intellect cannot accept the things that you believe. So therefore, you must be substandard. Your intellect is flawed and you you believe in God, but that that's ridiculous because God can't not exist. And so you rely on your intellect. Well, I got news for you. Your intellect ain't even going to buy you a cup of coffee. We need to understand that it is intellect that gets in the way of the most important element of beginning a life of faith. And that is simple, childlike faith. Jesus said, come to me as a little child. We need to have that essence of faith and innocence when we come to Him. But intellect gets in the way of that because we think we're too smart. In Proverbs 26, verse 12, and then verse 16, it says that there is one thing worse than a fool, and that is a man who is conceited. In other words, you think you're all that. He, in his own mind, the opinion that he has of himself is that he is smarter than seven wise men. You know how many people walk around today, don't want anything to do with God, don't want anything to do with Jesus, want nothing to do with the church, because they have this opinion that they're smarter than everybody else. Well, I got news for you. You're not smarter than everybody else. You're just conceited, and that's the implication of the proverb. There's another passage of Scripture in Psalm 36, verse 1 and 2. It says, sin whispers to the wicked deep within their hearts. They have no fear of God at all. And in their blind, here it is, conceit, they cannot see how wicked they really are. In their conceit, they don't see any moral boundaries. In their conceit, they don't see any need of God. In their conceit, in their deception of their intellect, they do not understand just how serious this matter is. The truth of it is this. They think they're intellectual. They think that they are so smart. But Proverbs 
gives us this essence of wisdom. Intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. And so if you say, well, I'm too intelligent to believe in God, you're not intelligent at all by the standards that we see because intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. They want to learn more. That's the characteristic and the nature of intelligent people. They don't close their minds off. They open their minds up to the possibilities. And yet, you know how many people have turned away Jesus Christ, turned away the things of God because they think they're smarter than that. Dear friend, if that's you, you're not as smart as you think you are. One day, you will die. And after that, will be the judgment. And the only thing that's going to matter in your life is what you did with Jesus. With that in mind, there are four steps to true faith in Christ. Here they are. Number one, curiosity. You see, a true intellectual person is curious. They want to know more. They want to understand more. They want to learn more. Uh, it is not a doubter that does not turn to God. It is a skeptic that does not turn to God. A skeptic lacks curiosity because they've already formulated their own opinion in their mind and therefore smarter than anyone else. They don't need to listen to anything. They don't need to listen to anyone. And their whole aspect of curiosity about life, about the end, about death, they have no essence of curiosity. When it comes to their deathbed, the only thing they're going to have is fear. Fear of the unknown. But dear friend, you don't have to fear that. You and I came to Jesus Christ because we had a measure of curiosity. In other words, we were intellectuals. We wanted to learn. We wanted to grow. We wanted to understand. And that is the essence of how Jesus came to be who he is and has invaded the lives of so many people throughout the millennia. The scripture says when he was there in Jerusalem, the Jewish Passover was coming up and crowds of people were making their way from the country up to Jerusalem to get themselves ready for the feast. It was a huge feast. They all came together. It was a great time. But here's the crux of it. They were curious about Jesus. Dear friend, if you consider yourself to be an intellectual person, let me encourage you, learn about Jesus. Try to understand a little bit about him. You see, these people were curious about Jesus. There was a lot of talk of him among those standing around the temple. What do you think? Do you think he'll show up for the feast or not? They were curious. They wanted to learn more about him. That's the very first step in this aspect of coming to true faith in Jesus Christ. You know what? I dare say the majority of you uh, were willing to sit down and listen to someone explain to something to you about Jesus or explain their experience with Jesus. But more significantly, I think the majority of us, we were curious. We went to church. We wanted to hear something about what was going on in this church, about who are they talking about? What is this Jesus that they are speaking of? How can I learn a little bit more about him and I can make my own decision? Interestingly enough, the scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it begins when our curiosity is piqued. That's the reason I always encourage people. Invite others to come to church. Invite them to come. Maybe they'll be curious enough. They'll want to see something. They'll want to understand something. And in the coming, the word of God will touch their heart and lives and they will become Step two, they will become convicted. What does that mean? Well, when you're convicted, you have this aspect of understanding who you are. You have this aspect of looking at yourself, not through rose-colored glasses, but looking at yourself honestly, looking at your faults just as much as you do your successes. And when we look at that in our lives, we become convicted. The scripture says in Acts chapter 2, as Peter was preaching, he said, listen, the whole house of Israel needs to know with certainty that God made this Jesus, whom you 
crucified. He was actually speaking to the same crowd of people who had stood there before Pontius Pilate and yelled, crucify him, crucify him. And Peter was now preaching to them. And he said, you need to understand. You need to know with absolute certainty that God made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. He is the Messiah, the promised one. When they heard this, they came under deep conviction and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what must we do? They were all Jews there at this time. They said, what must we do, brothers? What have we done? We crucified Jesus. And of course, they were convicted about that act, that specific act. One of the things that happens in our lives too, the reason we come to Christ is we become convicted about something in our lives. And you say, well, how did this happen? Why weren't they convicted before? Now they're suddenly convicted. Well, the reason is the power of the Holy Spirit. The scripture tells us in John chapter 16, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. They didn't want him to leave. He had said, I'm going. But if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. Now the word comforter is the word parakleto in the Greek. It is a reference to the Jesus, to the Holy Spirit that Jesus would give us. He would baptize us with this Holy Spirit when we accepted him, and the Holy Spirit would invade our lives. But he also is a force that works in the world around us. He said when he has come, he will convict the world in respect of sin. In other words, he's going to convict us because we are sinful. There's a reason it's very important for us to learn what sin is. And of course, uh, sin most often takes on the characteristics of a violation of God's law. But sin is so much more than that. We don't measure up to the, to the love and the holiness and the presence of God. But we understand that when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, that is a good thing because that's the second step in this true faith in Jesus Christ. First, we're curious. Now we're convicted of our sin. And he convicts us of righteousness, that we need to be right before God, and of judgment because God is the one who has the ability to judge our sin. And then he concludes it with this. Uh, the reason he convicts the world of sin is because they do not believe on me. Jesus said they don't believe in me. If they would just believe in me. Well, that leads to the third step. Convinced. You see, we curious, we become convicted of our sin, and then we become convinced that there is hope. In Acts chapter 28, uh, they had come together they had set a day with him. They came in large numbers to his lodging. Uh, and he fully set forth and explained the matter to them from morning until night. This is Paul. He's talking to the people. He explained these things about them from morning till night, testifying to the kingdom of God, trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets. That would have been the Old Testament. And some were convinced. They were absolutely convinced. They heard the word. They believed what he said. Others did not believe. That's, that's on them. They were skeptical by nature. Maybe some of them did become believers late, later on, but now we see that this all-important step is they became convinced that this Jesus is real and that he did die on the cross for me. He was buried and he did rise from the dead. In, uh, in Acts chapter 22, uh, Paul was, or uh, let me see this. In Acts chapter 22, yes, that's what we were looking at. Uh, in verse 20, we had this, um, I don't know where I am. Oh, I'm, I'm still in this convinced. I am convinced. In Romans 8, verses 38 and 39, uh, Paul the apostle said, after he had received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, he said, I am convinced. In other words, I have this absolute conviction within me. I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not death or life, not angels or rulers, not present things, nor future things, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or anything that has been created. Nothing 
can separate me from God's love. He became convinced in the true realities of Jesus Christ and what he had done for him on the cross and that it was permanent by nature when he accepted him. And the end result of all of that, curiosity, being convicted of my sin, being convinced that Jesus is real, is I become converted. And that happened to me. And that may have happened to you too. The Bible says here in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so at the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now two words there. I want you, if you have them in your scripture or if you uh, are following along and using the handout sheet that you can download and print that comes, repent. That word repent in the scriptures is the word metanoio. Now, it is comprised of two words, which means change and mind. In other words, my mind needs to be changed. It means to stop thinking the way you're thinking and start thinking differently. In other words, change your mind. A lot of people think repent means to change your behavior, but that doesn't do any good. Anybody can change their behavior. That's called religion. We religiously do this, or we religiously do that. And we change our behavior. I had a guy tell me one time, said, I can stop drinking and smoking and doing all these things anytime I want to. Well, good for you. That's not going to help, because just changing your behavior is not going to change who you are inside. you got to change your mind. you got to change the way you're thinking. And that is exactly what needed to take place here in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. These people had bought into a system of works. In other words, if I do this and do this and do this and do this, then I might get to heaven. And if I don't do these things, then that makes it even better and I might get to get to heaven. But they had no assurance. They had no no hope, no real hope. They were just living their lives like so many people do today. When you ask them, do you know for certain if you die that you're going to heaven? They'll say, I hope so. I hope so. Well, dear friend, you've got to change your thoughts. You've got to change your mind. The reason that you say you hope so is because you're basing it on your behavior. You're basing it on the things that you have done and not done. You think God's got this cosmic scale where he weighs out all of our good. I hope my good ain't weighs my bad. By the way, that's not in the scripture anywhere. I have no idea where they get that from except from the process of the scales of justice. But the Bible says when you and I receive Jesus Christ, we are justified fully before him. The word justified means just as if I have never sinned. He he takes all my sin, all the negative things, and he throws them away so that I don't have the penalty or the payment for those anymore. And so what we need to do is we start changing our mind and start thinking a different way. We start thinking about grace and truth and mercy. Repent. Stop thinking that you're getting to heaven on the basis of your performance and how you live your life. It's not happening. Don't trust in your wealth, your power, your intellect. You don't need to trust in any of those things. You need to change the way you think. That's what repent means. He says repent and be converted. Now that's the second word you might want to circle there and take note of. The word converted, epistrophos, epistrapho actually in this context, means to turn around. Turn around. You're going this direction. Turn around and go this way. That's what converted means. The Bible tells us that Paul gave us a wondrous example in Acts chapter 22 and verse 20 of what it means to be converted. In this passage of Scripture, he was talking about Stephen. Now, Stephen was one of the very first deacons in the church, and he was telling people about Jesus, and they took up stones and murdered him. And Saul, who was Paul's name, was Paul's name before he accepted Jesus, and God changed his name from Saul to Paul. And so uh, Stephen was murdered, Paul says, I was standing right there. I was holding the coats of the murderers and cheering them on. And now they see me a totally different person. I'm not that person anymore. I am totally converted. I'm not an enemy of Jesus. 
I am his servant. I am his bond slave. I have given my life to Jesus Christ. He said, what better qualification could I have? They see me totally, absolutely changed. And you see, when you change your mind, it changes everything else in your life. When you truly begin to place your faith in Jesus Christ, then he begins to change you from the inside out. We do not change from the outside in. You do not get cleaned up to come to God. You invite Jesus into your heart and life and he will begin to clean you up. That is the difference. You see, conversion requires a turning from and a turning to. In that passage in Acts chapter 20, Paul says, And when you, your witness, Stephen, was murdered, I was right there. Acts 20 and verse 21. He said, uh, I was there holding the coats. But actually, I've got to give you another verse. The Jews and Gentiles alike at that time, they understood the warning that they should turn from their sin to God and believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, friend, faith is simple but not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, heaven can be entered only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide enough for all the multitudes to choose its easy way. In other words, everybody goes that way. That's the easy way. But the gateway to life is small and the road is narrow and only a few ever find it. Let me ask you, dear friend, have you found it? Or has the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life kept you from seeing the right road? You don't just get onto it. I had a guy tell me one time, said, well, I'm going to hell and, and, and I'll see all my friends there. No, you won't. Hell is black as black can be. You cannot see anything. It is a place of eternal torment. There's nothing good about hell. But, there's a big wide road you can follow to get there. It's real simple. But Jesus is over this way. It's a narrow way. What did he mean by that? It's a narrow way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father except by me. What he meant was narrow there's only one way to get to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ our Lord. Everything we're going to look at over these next several weeks is going to be based on the foundation of faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, because only then can we develop the characteristics of a successful believer. Dear friend, do you know for certain if you died today that you would go to heaven? Do you? If you don't know for sure, you can know. These things in the Bible have been written that you might know that you have eternal life. So you don't have to say, I hope so. You can stand like me and say, oh yes, I know for sure that I am going to heaven when I die. I have an absolute faith and hope and trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He gave me his promise in his word. He sealed it with his blood. And he has given me his Holy Spirit to guide me that I might truly know that I'm a child of God. Do you want that? Do you want to know for certain if you died that you can go to heaven? Do you want to make sure that all your sin is forgiven and taken, as the scripture says, and cast away as far as the east is from the west to be remembered no more in the eyes and the heart of God? Do you want that? Then would you just bow your head with me right now and pray a simple prayer? All the Christians who are watching are praying for you. So let's bow together. Just say these words. Just say, Lord Jesus, I want to be forgiven of my sin and I want to have a home in heaven with you one day. Will you come into my life now Will you be my Savior to forgive me? I believe you died on the cross for me and shed your precious blood to forgive me. And I want to be forgiven. Will you wash me white as snow and take away my guilt and shame? 
Will you be my Lord to lead me, to help me make good and wise decisions? I believe that when they took you down from that cross, they laid you in a borrowed tomb, and you died in my place. Help me to make good decisions because you're now a part of my life and my Lord. And Lord, be my friend to walk with me. Not just here, but one day be able to walk the streets of heaven. Before I believe that when you rose from the dead, it was with great majesty and power. And that I will one day be able to get to heaven because of you. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my heart and my life and saving my soul. Now, dear friend, if you, if you prayed that prayer with me and you meant it with all of your heart, bear in mind that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord and believe in their heart that God the Father has raised him from the dead, they will be saved. You just received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Hey, let somebody know. Maybe you don't have anyone you can share it with, but you can drop me a note there at Pastor Howard at familyofgodcc.com. I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching tonight and for your many, many encouraging words and prayers that I get often. I pray that you would develop the characteristics and be everything that God created you to be. He wants you to be successful. May you be so. Dear friends, until we see each other next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift his countenance upon you to watch over you no matter where you go. And as we leave this time together, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. As always, keep looking up.